capital in the 21st century. An analysis of data for 20, from 20 countries that un uncovers key economic patterns about inequality. It's the number one bestseller on Amazon.com and so popular, it's currently sold out. The book has already sold out, sold about 85,000 copies, including e-books, and the Harvard University Press has orders on hand for another 90,000. And everyone is talking about it. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and dozens of other news outlets. MSNBC's Chris Hayes sat down with PKT for an, for an extended interview. This, right here, is seriously the talk of the town. And again, it's 685 pages, heavy pages, of economic history, which is not quite the usual profile of a chart-topping bestseller. But maybe it shouldn't seem so unusual. In fact, right now, sharing the top of the bestseller list on Amazon.com are Elizabeth Warren's biography, A Fighting Chance, and Michael Lewis's Flash Boys, two books that also focus on questions of inequality. And economic inequality has been a buzz term for world leaders from Pope Francis to President Obama. Which leads me to ask, is in economic inequality the new hot topic? Country? And is that shift coming at a time when we desperately need it to be at the top of the agenda? Joining, joining me now, Jillian Melchor writes for the National Review as a fellow for the Independent Women's Forum. Michael Pepper, theology professor at Fordham University, contributor to Common Wheel magazine. Tamara Drought, vice president of policy and research at the think tank, at the think tank Demos. And back with us again, Marcus Mabry editor at large at the New York Times. I know I, I messed up your last name. No, you I'm got sorry. it. I got it right? Yeah. Good. Great job. So is this shift towards a more widespread consciousness about economic inequality? I'm going to start, start with you. Okay. Good. Is it? I mean. Yeah. I mean, is this, this is great, right? We have three top books. Um, you know what I think is this tells us is that there's a real hunger in our nation to explain something that we've kind of felt deep in our bones for a while. And what this does is it gives us a framework for understanding what is happening. And you know, I think that inequality really started being hot um, several years ago with Occupy. You know, mm -hmm. we like to dismiss them, but we have to give them real credit for introducing, the, popularizing the idea of the 1% and the 99%. And then we had Citizens United, we recently had McCutcheon, and I think it's becoming much more palpable to the everyday American that something is seriously wrong, that our democracy and our economy clearly seem to be benefiting the wealthy while the rest of us are sort of struggling to stay afloat. Marcus, do you agree? Is this a shift towards a more widespread consciousness about economic inequality? You know, Jonathan, I don't know. I mean, maybe I think is the best answer we have right now, or maybe this is actually just a phenomenon we're seeing amongst those who buy books on Amazon. That's a lot of people, but that ain't the whole country. <laughs> and I think politically, we'll really get a sense, I think, with the midterm elections this year. The, the Democrats, Barack Obama, really hope that this will be the main topic of discussions, the question on which these midterms will be decided. Because if it's about inequality, if it's about Americans being fatigued at the gutting of the middle then the Democrats have a much better chance of, for instance, holding on to the United States Senate. If it's not about that, then the, then the Republicans have a much better chance of recapturing the Senate. So I think we'll see really how widespread, how mass is this movement and this fatigue with growing in income inequality in America in just a few months. So the New York Times recently published a pretty stunning graphic. Um, and it shows that, that American incomes are only leading the world when you look at the top half of earners. And, and here you see the change in median income over the period of 10 years broken up by income percentile with the poorest fifth on the left and the richest fifth on the right. And the very top percentile of earners are seeing these dramatic income increases over time. But when you look at the bottom half of, of earners, we are not only falling behind other countries, but we're also seeing slow or negative growth of income. Should we look at a graph like that? and question the, the direction our country is headed. Well, that, that's from The Upshot, which is this brand new, largely statistical reporting based uh, website that we just launched this week. Mm -hmm. uh, and it really kind of digs down deep into the numbers to let you know exactly as you were saying, this, what you've been feeling in your gut, this impression that people are not doing as well as they used to, the social escalator in America is not working as well as it once did. It really kind of makes those realities come to life through the numbers. And I think most embarrassing for Americans, and it is I think embarrassing, is the fact that if you're from any other Western country uh, and you're really seriously middle class, not upper middle class or upper class, but middle class or working class or working poor, you are actually declining 
declining and losing the race mm -hmm. as people in those same classes in other Western countries continue to develop greater assets. You're actually falling behind. So, so Jillian, the fact that we're, we're having this conversation, we're talking about these books, is it positive that questions of, about economic inequality are in the public spotlight right now? Well, I think it's positive because it's pretty indisputable that there's an economic issue going on. I think seizing on the issue of economic inequality and equality is a winning issue because everybody wants to be told they deserve to make more money. The flip side of that is, though, what policies it's going to result in. And I'm kind of concerned that some of the policies that have been furthered are actually going to end up hurting those that, at sort of the, the base of society, they're really struggling to get a leg up. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael, the, the Pope has made uh, income inequality <laughs> part of, right. of just his, his papacy. Right. And I, just have, I have to ask you, does, does the message that the Pope has make a difference in terms of our nation and the world's awareness right. of, of an attention to inequality, does it make a difference? I think it does. I think we see that difference uh, that we talked about another time with President Obama quoting Pope Francis and using Pope Francis's popularity around the world and his speaking about inequality as a way for President Obama to almost get back to his own message that he lost sight of or, uh, for, for a couple of years there. I think that when we look at the Catholic social teaching about, about capital, about wealth, about inequality, uh, it certainly encourages people to move beyond the initial bottom line of profits to a second bottom line of people, right? How, how does a corporation's uh, activities affect the people in the corporation and the people outside of it? But with Pope Francis, we're going to get even a third one. You know, he's writing an encyclical about ecology. And in the sustainability movement, they talk about the triple bottom line mm -hmm. of profits, people, and planet. And you can see that there's this overarching theory of how wealth ought to be distributed in a way that goes toward human dignity, uh, toward human flourishing, and also toward a sustainable attitude toward the environment. So, okay, so we know that the topic is hot, but what can we, what, what can we do? issue to becoming quite mainstream, in part because of the rhetorical push the issue has been getting from none other than the president. President Obama has been pushing for an increase in the minimum wage to $10.10, and he's been framing it like this. It is time to give America a race. Say yes. Give America a race. It's time for 1010. It's time to give America a race. And the president has commended companies that already pay more than the federal minimum wage, like when he visited Costco and said you could tell workers there feel good about their jobs and company. And he's publicly applauded companies that have bumped up their minimum wage since his initiative began, like Gap, which raised it to $9 an hour this year. He even shouted out Minnesota pizza uh, company owner John Serrano during his State of the Union address, praising his company for raising its employee minimum wage to $10 an hour. Even though there hasn't been traction in Congress on raising the minimum wage, the president's rhetoric seems to be making a difference. In his weekly, radio, his weekly address uh, yesterday, he told this story about one response to his State of the Union address. A couple of weeks ago, a letter from a small business owner who watched that night. Here's what she wrote. I was moved by John Serrano's story. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. So a few weeks ago, Yasmin put in place a plan to lift wages for her employees at both her restaurants to at least $10 an hour by the end of this year. <clears throat> So, can an elevated national dialogue about economic inequality be a catalyst for change? I throw that out to the table. Can it? I think we're already seeing it happen. Um, we're looking at minimum wage fights really bubbling up in major cities across the country. The president has made it a signature issue. So, I think that we're seeing a real sea change and real momentum that 725 an hour. Most Americans think that is insane and agree that we need to significantly increase the federal minimum wage in this country. And the other thing I'll say is the reason why I think this is really starting to get momentum is you have a really great mix of people. You have the private sector, you have CEOs of companies saying it's time we do this, Gap, Costco, Whole Foods, and then you have the religious community who's also really shining a spotlight on this. Couple that with the um, burgeoning protests we've seen in the fast food sector and retail. And I think all of this together, sort of the power of people and the power of ideas in the form of these books, 
are coming together and I think that's when we see real change happen. You know, I think with issues like the minimum wage, you've got to look at a cost benefit and that's like any policy. So the benefit is that some people would potentially get higher wage, but if we're talking about income inequality, Congressional Budget Office has predicted that raising the minimum wage to 10 10 is going to cost about half a million jobs by 2016. I mean, with it, it's inevitably going to cost jobs. And that's because if you have minimum wage, I mean, why not raise it beyond 10-10? Why not $20? Why not $30? At some point, there's a cost there. And I really think that cost is going to hit the most vulnerable members of society. I mean, if you look at every 10% increase, there's about a 1% to 3% effect on jobs for teenagers. Black teenagers have the highest rate of unemployment in the country. That's, that's really unfortunate. So I think when we look at this, yeah, we do want higher pay for a lot of people. But we have to understand there's a cost associated but with that. But isn't that an argument that, ha yeah. that happens mm -hmm. every time that there's a, 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 yeah. an increase in the minimum wage or even talk of an increase in the yeah. minimum wage? There's always someone who comes out and says, but it's going to cost jobs. But it hasn't been borne out because we have real life examples. Um, Washington State since 1998 has had the highest minimum wage, highest statewide minimum wage. In fact, in the last 15 years, the economy in Washington state has grown faster than all other 49 states. They've also seen job growth in the very sectors that we always hear are going to lose jobs, in retail, in bars, in restaurants. So we have real world examples. We can talk theory or we can talk what's really happening. Well, San Francisco's uh, to, thriving. To that point though, I mean, how high do you think is too high to go before it starts costing jobs? I mean, you'd agree, right, that a $50 minimum wage is going to cost jobs at some point. So where do you find that right line? Where do you find the limit where it's not going to cost jobs but benefit people? Could I jump in on this? Because yeah. one of the things that I think this, this book and related discussions have brought to light is focusing on ratios more than absolute numbers. The ratios within companies, ratios within societies in which you look at what the top wage earners are earning versus what their median or lowest earners mm -hmm. are earning. And those ratios are out of control right now. So everyone agrees to that what? fact. So we're talking about, uh, you know, 273 to 1 being, if that's the right number, still median CEOs to kind of low wage earners. And some companies get over 1,000 to 1 in terms of well, the highest. Yeah. Well, Demos has right. a report yeah. about, about CEOs in the, in the fast food industry. Yeah. It's 1,200 times the earnings of the average fast food worker, the, the fast food CEO, and the ratio remained above 1,000 to 1 in 2013. Right. And when I read this report, I, I wondered what on earth could, can be done to close that gap? Is there anything that can be done to change that? Well, go ahead. Uh, the minimum wage is one. That would be a great start. But I also think that um, the report has a lot of traction and we'll be doing a lot of briefings with big institutional investors. You know, when we released the report, um, the comptroller of New York City, Scott Stringer, helped us release the report because the reality is this is starting to impact shareholders. This is bad for business. It has reached the point where it is affecting, like if you look at performance in the fast food sector, wait times are up. It's taking longer through the drive through Turnover is increasing. All of that is really bad for business. And McDonald's itself, in its SEC filing, mm -hmm. highlighted the fact that inequality is, one of, is a growing risk to their company. And that's the hope. The great hope is that there will be this convergence and there is this convergence happening right. between what the people want, what private sector wants, and what government wants. That all says this increasing inequality is a problem for us. We actually, it's not sustainable for a capitalist society. What Thomas Peakley's book says, though, at Capital, is that in fact, with the aberration of World War II and the great middle class that it spurned for American society and therefore the world, with that only exception, Capital and capitalism has actually created inequalities and growing inequalities forever since it's existed. Now that's a theory. We'll see very soon, I think, mm -hmm. if it's borne out. Because if, the, if change doesn't happen, if there's not minimum wage that happens uh, nationally, then, then I think we're going to see greater and greater social dislocation and disruption. And that is going to have to be our last word. Thank you, uh, Marcus Mabry, Jillian Melcher, uh, Tamara Drought. Marcus Mabry, Jillian. I said everybody. <laughs> I did say everybody. Keep okay. Marcus Mabry. Up next.